anyone who is out there in this moment listening to this right now who is really having a hard time trying to figure out, you know, I have this thing that I'm really good at, but I'm just not sure how this is going to work into a business or possibly a job. I'm just I'm just not sure what the next thing is, how I should start this. Rita, do you have any tips or strategies you can share with us to help us begin to at least put some framework around that so that we can start getting at least a direction to go? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh, first off, it's wonderful if you have an idea of what it is that you want to go for because that is, that's the most important part. Every once in a while, I'll work with someone who really is not certain which direction do I want to go, what do I want to have make happen, and that's a whole other ball game. When you know what it is that you want to do, the very most important piece of advice I can give you is that you need to begin with the end in mind. There's nothing more important than that. You need to see, even if you don't know how, you don't have a clue how, you need to see whatever it is that you're looking to create or do as a finished project in your mind's eye. You're listening to the Creativepreneur Podcast, Episode 22, and today we're talking about turning your inspiration into your vocation. The do's and don'ts for giving legs and voice to your gift. So, stay tuned. Hello, my name is Rodney Washington, author, artist, and entrepreneur, and I'm passionate about helping creatives just like you do what lights you up and make a comfortable living while doing it. Each week, I'll be sharing timely business growth, marketing, and mindset hacks in interviews with courageous creative entrepreneurs to inspire you to get paid for your creativity. So grab your favorite beverage, sit back, and enjoy today's show. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by my free audio book and PDF, Get Paid for Your Creativity, 57 Ways to Monetize Your Gifts and Create True Security for Yourself. To get your hands on a copy of the free audio book and PDF, go to getpaidforyourcreativity.com forward slash 57 ways gift. Welcome back. This week, I have something very special to bring to you. I decided to go into my archives and pull a very special interview I did a few years ago with a dear friend and colleague, Rita Dale Barber. Rita was a presenter on a three-day live event, virtual event that I hosted called the Monetize Your Gifts Masterclass. And she shared some very valuable content that I know is just as fresh and relevant as when she first presented. On the interview, we talked about the power of visualization, asking for what you want, and using social media responsibly, and how to deal with those pesky naysayers. You know those people that you may have in your life, although I truly hope you don't, but those folks who tell you that you're crazy for going for your dreams. Anyway, this interview is packed with so much content that I had to create a downloadable summary guide to accompany the regular show notes, and you can get your hands on that guide by going to getpaidforyourcreativity.com forward slash 022 for episode 22. As a matter of fact, I suggest you stop the podcast now and go download that summary guide so you have it handy while you're listening. Again, you can get that by going to getpayforyourcreativity.com forward slash 022 for episode 22. Of course, if you're driving, working out, or going for a walk, obviously, you won't be able to download it now. But as soon as you have an opportunity to grab it, print it out and have it handy when you re-listen. Finally, I have one caveat. Rita made an offer for a six-week course at the end of the original presentation, but I'm certain that that offer is no longer available, as this recording, as I mentioned at the top of the introduction, is a few years old. But if you found value in the things that Rita shared, as I no doubt feel you will, feel free to reach out to her. I'll provide links to her social media contacts info in the show notes for this episode and see what she's offering if something similar to the original offer and be sure to tell her how you heard of her. So enjoy today's episode. I look forward to seeing you on episode 23 of the podcast. So on more t- one more time, to grab those show notes, including the special summary guide, go to getpayforyourcreativity.com forward slash 022 for episode 22. I hope you enjoy today's show. First, I just want to start off by saying, Rita, welcome. And I'm glad you're able to connect with us. I am too. Thank you. And I and I apologize, everybody, for waiting. And like Rodney, I thank you for being here today. 
Oh, thank you. So Rita's topic this evening is turn your inspiration into your vocation, the do's and don'ts for giving legs and voice to your gift. I love that title. Briefly, Rita Barber has over 16 years of in-depth experience as a career strategist, helping people launching new businesses and changing fields put their best foot forward when presenting themselves. A public speaker who delivers high-energy, vision-packed presentations that stick with her audiences. Rita has extended her professional practice to include teaching others how to convey their vision, mission, and message to groups in in the hundreds, including many C-level executives. She is the director of UNI, a multimedia company founded in 2008 in the U.S., and UNI specializes in facilitating workshops and presentations for individuals and organizations and publishing with the vision of empowering others to achieve their own brand of success. Before launching her business, Rita enjoyed a successful 18-year career in recruiting and telecommunications, where she consistently ranked no lower than number four in nationwide companies with hundreds of employees. Rita suggests that a a picture paints a thousand words, so allow your words to be the portrait of your success. Love that. Rita, Barbara, thank you so much for coming today. Welcome, and I'm glad that you're here, and we're ready to hear how do we turn our inspiration into our vocation? I love that title. So, Rita, I've given probably as much background on you as I possibly could, but is, <laughs> <laughs> but is, is there a particular story about you that you'd like to share with us just to kind of tell us how did you get to this place? How did you come to this place of doing the things you do to help people tap into their passion and 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 use it to actually create a career for themselves. How did you get started doing that? I've always been the kind of person that tends to look up for what it is that I want to go for rather than to look back and say, I don't have this and I don't have that. Uh, Very briefly, I bought my first piece of property when I was 18, and I did so out of necessity, really, because we, my family was about to be foreclosed upon, and I was in college at the time, and I figured there's got to be something I can do about this situation, and it was a never-look-back kind of moment for me. Later on, when I went into recruiting, I very much enjoyed helping people find positions that worked for them in the areas that they liked. And I'm the kind of person who also will just very straight out say if something either really resonates for me and really excites me or it doesn't. So there's never been too much time that I'll spend on saying, oh, this isn't going to work, so I'm going to do something different. And at a certain point as a recruiter, I decided I want to do something different. I want to get into high tech, which is when I got into telecommunications. I left recruiting as the number one account executive in the United States out of 290 offices. So that's a large number of account executives that I beat out, so to speak, for the number one spot. And I didn't do it so that I would be number one. I did it because I wanted to be the best me that I could possibly be. I did the same sort of thing in telecommunications and ended up number four in the United States for a nationwide telecommunications company. But the real moment that changed my life happened when I was at a state fair in the state of Washington. I lived just outside of Seattle in a place called Kirkland, And my husband decided that I should go to a state fair. I'd never been to one before and really had no real desire to go, but he said, no, it'll be a wonderful time. Let's go. So we took the kids and we went to the state fair. I really didn't like some of the people that I saw there, the people that they called carnies. They looked very hard and very mean. And I decided at a certain point that I didn't want my son going on any ride that a carny was was basically controlling because I thought, wow, these people don't look very safe. And so we finally decided, after spending the day at the state fair, to go home. And we're in the parking lot, and it's around dusk. And I'm looking down this parking lot, which was basically a dirt road parking lot. And at the distance, I could see something moving that wasn't moving the same way everything else was moving in the breeze. I decided to go over and see what it was. And I found, just about at sunset, a baby crawling around in the parking lot. I went over and I picked up the baby and I thought, oh my gosh, who could ever let a baby just wander in this parking lot with these rows and rows of cars? It was an unimaginable scene to me. So I went with the baby to my husband and I said, someone's deserted a baby, let's take it home. 
And my husband reminded me that they call that sort of thing kidnapping. So I thought, okay. I, I said, you know, let me at least do this. Let me see if I can figure out where the baby belongs. And we're walking along, and I see all these tents and, and little, I guess they're RVs, and I decided maybe the baby belongs to one of these people that are there. And I'm walking along, and it's just about dark, and out of the blue, another baby happens along. This one is bigger. And I pick this baby up, too, and I'm thinking, what is this madness? Finally, this woman comes out, and these babies are so loving and wonderful, and I'm a real mom kind of person, so I fall in love in about one minute. And I'm holding these babies, and this woman comes out, and she said, these are my kids. And I looked at her, and the mom and me just started scolding her. I said, what are you thinking about? How can you let these babies wander around like this? And then with the very last bit of light that we had left, I realized that she was all beaten up on one side of her face. And when I realized what the situation was, and I had this picture of these mean carnies that were at the fair, I just looked at her and I said, you know, your life doesn't have to be like this. Why don't you come home with me? You can bring your babies, bring your stuff, just come home. And she looked at me and she said, no, I'm not going anywhere. And she took the babies and I went home. And, and I have to tell you, I couldn't get the scene out of my mind. I couldn't eat. I could barely function because I thought to myself, what's going on here? What can I do to turn this situation around? After many, many days of contemplating it, I finally said to my husband, you know, I need to go back to volunteering because at a certain point I was volunteering at different women's shelters helping women go back to work. And I said, I need to go back to volunteering. And he said, you know, we really can't afford you to be a volunteer any longer. We've got two little kids. We can't afford a babysitter. This is not the time to do that. I'm sorry you can't do it. So like any good self-respecting housewife, I decided to ignore him. And I decided to look for a place to volunteer. And as it would happen, a organization that was run by the state of Washington contacted me and said, we're not looking for a volunteer but we are looking to hire someone to professionally work with people to help them find out what they're passionate about and to help them produce a new career for themselves or a business. Are you interested? And I tell you what, it was like a, are you kidding me? I mean, it was just a, a moment for me that was huge because all of a sudden I realized that everything that I'd been sharing with people on a volunteer basis in terms of go after your dream, make this happen, you can make money at what you're doing and everything, all of a sudden I realized that I, I should have been doing it for myself. And I hadn't even occurred to me because I was so busy thinking about what other people needed. I went in for the interview. I got the position. I worked for a number of years in the state of Washington at various community colleges and community centers and absolutely loved helping people find that aha moment this is what I want to do, and then helping them work out the plan to make it happen for themselves. When I moved to California, I thought I would work for the state of California because they had to have it over here too, but lo and behold, they didn't. And at that moment, that's when I thought, you know what? You, everything you've been through has brought you to a certain point. You need to open up your own business and make this sort of thing happen. And so I've been working on an individual one-on-one -on -one basis with people and then collectively with people. And frankly, that we're all collectively together here today is a great thing because I believe that even when you're not speaking with one another, there is an energy that happens where you are ignited by other people so that you move closer to making that which you want to have happen in your life happen for you. So this is a story about how I got to where I'm going right now. I have to tell you, I'm madly in love with what I do. I always meet the best people. I always have the best workshops. And so I'm here to answer any questions and help you move forward with your dreams. Well, what I'm this what I'm going to do is I have a few you know basic points I want to go over, and then I'll probably come up with some questions of my own that I will want to ask you, and and we'll just keep it moving forward. So I love that story because that really sums up, and you know, it goes it goes back to what I've said a little bit ago is how uh, in one of the previous calls is how nothing that we do is ever wasted. Everything feeds into the next phase of our life, the next thing that we will do. And it's so interesting how our personal stories influence so much of the decisions that we make 
about what inspires us to start now the professional thing that we do. And you shared a beautiful story about how you actually trend, how you moved into quite elegantly. I should, well, I won't say elegantly, but it was, it was. But I'm sure it maybe it felt like elegantly at moments when you moved into what you're now doing now, just by following your intuition and doing what you really felt in your heart you wanted to share. For someone who is out there in this moment listening to this right now, who is really having a hard time trying to figure out. You know, I have this thing that I'm really good at, but I'm just not sure how this is going to work into a business or possibly a job. I'm just, I'm just not sure what the next thing is, how I should start this. Rita, do you have any tips or strategies you can share with us to help us begin to at least put some framework around that so that we can start getting at least a direction to go? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh, First off, it's wonderful if you have an idea of what it is that you want to go for because that is, that's the most important part. Every once in a while, I'll work with someone who really is not certain which direction do I want to go, what do I want to have make happen, and that's a whole other ball game. When you know what it is that you want to do, the very most important piece of advice I can give you is that you need to begin with the end in mind. There's nothing more important than that. You need to see, even if you don't know how, you don't have a clue how, you need to see whatever it is that you're looking to create or do as a finished project in your mind's eye. Because if you don't have a firm image of what it is that you want to do, then you'll never, ever find a way to get there. I always think about it in terms of building a pyramid, so to speak. So you think in terms of that very top brick of the pyramid. That's the thing that you want to do. That is the the passion that you have, the direction you want to go. Let's say, as an example, you decide that you want to be a workshop facilitator. So that's at your very top brick right up there. Then what you want to do is you want to flesh out the details and you work backwards. And one thing that I think is a very good idea to do is to create a a meditative visualization for yourself. Anybody can do it for themselves too. You don't have to go to someone special to have it done. It's always wonderful to have group-led meditations, but you can just take a moment, get away from the noise, get away from everything that is distracting to you. So it could mean that you need to go take a walk to the park or get on a bus or go sit somewhere away from everything. And do be sure that you have pen and paper in hand. Take a few deep breaths and just close your eyes and see what it is that you want to create. And take the time to put yourself in the environment of that. Let's pretend that we're talking about, as an example, the workshop facilitator again. If I put myself in a meditative spot with that, what I'll see is, begin with the end in mind, I see a room full of people that are all engaged, that are all ready to move forward with the idea of their dream. And I would talk about how the room looked. I could say in my own process, the room is a beautiful peach color. I own the room. In fact, I own the entire facility that everybody is in. And I see the parking lot filled with cars not only with people that were able to help, but also with people that work for me on my staff. And you flesh out the kinds of people that are in your staff. I have an administrative assistant. I have an accountant who works for me full-time and a part-time accountant as well. You bring out all those details and don't leave anything out and don't think that anything is ridiculous. You cannot even begin to imagine what you will draw to yourself by putting out the details of what it is that you want. It's absolutely phenomenal. I'm very lucky in that I have a wonderful mentor, a gentleman by the name of Mark Allen, and he is the owner of New World Library. And he's a gentleman who taught me a lot about moving out further. You know, always think to yourself, this is what I see as the end result. How do I get all the the points that make it happen? And even when you see it, See if you can make it even bigger still, because you probably can. Our problem isn't that we don't have big enough dreams. Our problem is that we don't dream big enough. And so when we think to ourselves, okay, this is what I want, see if you can take it a step further and make it even bigger still. That's amazing. You know, I'm uh, Mark Allen, I, rem- I had to think for a moment when you said New World Library, and I remember he, he wrote a book many years ago. It's a really... Really little book. I can't remember the name of it right now, but God, that was a powerful book. 
And um, to hear that he's your mentor, I'm just, wow, I'm blown away because he is amazing. I mean, he really talks about this and visioning where you want to go and taking some time to drop in with yourself and getting really clear as your first step. So I really appreciate you sharing that, Rita. Let me share one other thing, if you don't mind. Absolutely. I want to share this whole relationship about how I got to know Mark Allen with you and with everybody who's listening because this is something that every single person can do. But the problem is is that a lot of times we don't have enough guts to do it. I decided that I wanted to be Mark Allen when I grew up. Really, that's what it came down to. I read his book, Visionary Business. It was the very first Mark Allen book that I read. And I read this book. It was in the 1990s. I loved the message in it. I loved all the information in it. And I decided to use it as a guideline, so to speak. And as a matter of fact, I decided to start buying all the books on tape that he had of that book to give out, as many as I possibly could, to the different people in my workshops and everything. One day I found out that Mark Allen was going to be coming into Santa Cruz. I don't remember how I bumped into it. It might have been on the web or what have you. Well, I decided, what the heck, no guts, no glory. So I picked up the telephone, and I called his office, and I asked to speak to him. And lo and behold, he answered the phone. And I said, I understand that you're going to be in Santa Cruz, which is where I'm from. And I said, I wonder if I could buy you a cup of coffee. And he said, he he didn't even know what to say. But he did say yes. How wonderful is that? (laughs) Now, I was so crazy excited at the idea of having this gentleman be my mentor because I had laser vision. He's going to be my mentor. There's no way he's going to say no. I was so completely excited that when I met him, I had my daughter with me too, by the way, and at the time she was about, so I don't know, 12, 13 years old. When I met him, I barely let the gentleman sit down. And I looked at him and I said, I want you to be my mentor. And he looked at me. <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, thank God I've got my daughter with me because that way he doesn't think I'm a complete nut job. And, and he said, well, what exactly are you looking for? And I told him, I shared with him what my vision was and what my plan was. And I shared with him how inspired I was by not only the first book that I read that he did, but many other books thereafter. And also, I love New World Library and what New World Library stands for. And I said, I, would you consider being my mentor? And he said, yes, I will. And we laid out the ground rules about how this relationship was going to work. And I have to tell you, I learned so many different things from him. And he's always been this extremely candid person. So I share that with you, not so that everybody hounds Mark Allen so much, but so that you can think about what is it that I'm passionate about And who is my role model for what it is that I want to do? And then reach out to that person. Reach out to that person to do an informational interview. Reach out to that person to find out if you can just spend a few days with that person in their office or whatever that surrounding is. Reach out to that person because most people that are successful want to help other people become successful. Right. And and if I can add on to that, Rita, they want to help people who – will do the thing a lot of times which most people will not do, and that's ask and reach out. That's right. That's exactly right. It's it's a very funny thing. We are sometimes so afraid to ask. We're afraid to ask for help. We're afraid to, to accept help. But the reality of it is, and I heard this wonderful example of why asking for help is so important, and it creates a great image in your mind. If I said to you to take a deep breath and then said to you, exhale and count to 30 and keep on exhaling, you would never be able to exhale and count all the way to 30. I can guarantee you that. And then if my next thing that I said to you is, you know, doctors have proved that the most important thing in life is to only exhale, you would say, are you kidding me? If I don't inhale, there's no way that I can exhale, right? Mm -hmm. The same thing is true when we talk about our gifts. It's great that we have our gifts and everything, but we need to understand that people want to give to us. That's part of why we're all here today on the, in this conversation and through this whole series that Rodney's put together. We're here to give because that's the natural thing, and you must receive in kind. And when you receive and when you give, then the whole flow of everything works so much better for you. Brilliant. You know, thank you so much for saying that that whole that whole piece, Rita. And you really inspired me to think of something here for in just a moment, because I again, it's 
so many of these conversations over the last three days have completely overlapped and segued and, and flowed in and out of one another, which was such a nice surprise that I, I kind of hoped or thought maybe would happen, but it's actually happened in an amazing way. And when I listen to one of you, like you say things, you made me think of Corey Wadden, who we had on the call yesterday evening, who spoke about his vision book and putting in people that he most wanted to meet. And he has met now, I think, 10 highly influential millionaires because he set the intention that I'm going to meet this person and rearranged whatever needed to happen in his life to put himself in that place where he was able to meet these people. And it's had a huge impact on his results. And you said something a moment, just a second, just now that I just really want to echo again, is that people out there also have their gifts that they want to give to you. So while the frame of this event has been about you using your gifts, remember other people have their gifts. Every one of the presenters that have been with this program, including Rita now, is sharing her gift with you. And it's just something that I really think we kind of underscore a little bit. You know, if you think about it, if I was starting at that starting point where I was not quite sure how to go to the next direction, but I got clear about what I wanted to do, my first thought would be, who in this industry would be my touchstone? Who would be that person that I could name that would be the person that I would mo that epitomizes what I want to create in my life? And you know, get a picture of them from the Internet and put it in your own little journal or magazine or put them up on a Pinterest board or what have you and put some energy into it. And I, I've seen it myself. You've illustrated it, Rita. Corey il illustrated it last night. Something will happen. They'll they'll come into town or you'll be called away to go somewhere in a city where they'll happen to be and they're doing a book signing or they're getting ready to speak and or something. Something always happens if you set pure intention behind your vision, behind your dream. So, um, you know, I really appreciate you for sharing that story about how you met Mark, and that was a gift to me that I didn't expect to have come out of this because we never spoke about that. So thank you for sharing that, Rita. Oh, yeah. Oh, most definitely. And it's very true. I tell you what, I tested it out. I, I had a moment where I thought to myself, could it possibly be true that if we visualize something and put enough detail to it, we can actually create it in our life. Could that be possible? And I thought to myself, why not test it out? And at the time that I decided to test it out, I was driving a car that was many, many, many years old, and it was it was broken. I mean, it was it, it didn't have heat in the winter. It didn't have air in the summer. The dog ate most of the seatbelts. I mean, oh, my heavens, this car was a wreck. And I said, I need to get a new car. And when I said that, and I, my husband was there, I said, I need to get a new car. And he said, oh, we'll go look for this, that, or the other thing. And he mentioned a bunch of used cars. And I said, I'm not buying a used car. I'm buying a new car. And he said, his usual thing, we can't afford that. And so I decided to take what I had been learning and absorbing about visualization and creating what you want, I decided to put together a board. And on this board, I decided that my dream car was going to be a Mazda, or excuse me, a Saab uh, 900, and that it was going to be scarab green with cream interior. And I went to the Saab dealership, and I remember I would just sit in that car and smell that new car smell. I had a dealership guy take pictures of me in the scarab green car. I had a whole poster board up there with it. I had the date that I finished creating my board and the date that I saw myself getting my car and through a series of events that, I tell you right now, there was no accident to it, through a series of events, boom, I ended up getting the car something like three weeks before the due date on the car that I had. Wow. Now, here's the funny part, though. There's, there's always something, and this is why I say, you know, always think about how big you're dreaming and always challenge yourself to dream bigger. I shared that information with this amazing woman who I met. I mean, she was just amazing, so powerful and confident and everything. And I said, you're not going to believe this. I did this thing, and oh, my gosh, I've got my car in the parking lot and everything. It's so cool. I said, I think I've discovered magic. And she said, oh, absolutely. She said, yeah, I discovered it too. And I said, really? She said, yeah, I did it with a car too. I said, that's really neat. And I said, what kind of car do you drive? And she said, oh, I drive a Mercedes. And I thought to myself, whoa. <laughs> and I thought, that is a real lesson. I mean, why was I thinking of a sob? I should have gone for a Mercedes. You know? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, 
you know, and I and I can add, well, for me personally, is that you know we 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 put these containers around ourselves about how far we can go, and um, or what we can have, and we realize that um, uh, you know uh, it, that you know we may be asking for we may be asking for what we think we can get, but what we really want is this, but we won't ask for it. The bottom line is is that whatever we really want is available to us, but again, as you just beautifully illustrated, is all results in. In asking, just asking, not so much who you ask, but asking. You have to ask. You may hear no. You probably will in most instances, but you have to keep asking, and it will. And and eventually, you'll, you know, eventually the yes will come if it's right for you to have. I believe it'll come. So, I, I, I do you. believe that too. And I think the other part that's important too is to not beat yourself up and and to not. Take a no as the final answer. I, I think a lot of people, I've worked with many people that have said, well, I wanted to go for this, but this is what happened, and so therefore I, I decided to give it up. And, it, you know, no is never a final thing. It never is. It's always an opportunity to say, all right, where do I go from here? But it's never a final. Right. Absolutely. Beautiful, Rita. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now, Rita, now let's take it to the next level. So we have now discovered what our dream is, our vision. We're going for it. And actually, we're now actually in the process of putting it out into the world so that we can connect it to other people who actually want to work with us and and, 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 and you know and support financially uh, the dream that we want to have for ourselves. But you have some very specific specific strategies on on how to can take your inspiration and actually turn it into a professional message. So you call it finding your voice. Um, could you share a little bit so a little bit about that with us and how we actually can accomplish that? Yes, I, I noticed that in the beginning when you were introducing me, you you spoke about Toastmasters, and Toastmasters is certainly a great way to learn how to do some of that. Because the thing is, is that if you want to go to someone, and you don't have to be in Toastmasters, by the way. But if you want to go to someone and you want to ask for them their help, you need to have a message that you're going to give them. And you need to really think out and hone in what that message is. What What is the purpose of it? If you were going to come to me, let's say as an example, and you were going to say, Rita, I need $20,000 for XYZ, just saying it like that doesn't really tell me why I should do it. Even if it's somebody who I'm incredibly close with, it's kind of like, yeah, okay. And But on the other hand, if you're saying, this is what I see, this is what I'm creating, this is, this is the direction that I'm going, I need this to happen, I need this part here to make it happen. And instead of asking me directly, by the way, saying, who would you know that could help me with this, a lot of times you'll find that one person may not give you the whole 20000 let's say, but might be willing to give you a part of that, and another person might be willing to give you another part of that too. But it comes down to the message that you deliver first. And this is where it gets to be a problem with some people. They either say way too much or they say way too little, and you have to find what is that proper amount. So generally speaking, again, I always think that pen to paper is a good way to go, or keyboard if you're a fiend on the keyboard and can type out very quickly. And what I suggest is that you write out what what is this that I'm doing? What is this that I need the money for? Who is the audience that would be interested in what it is that I'm doing? What whatever that group is. It could be let's say you're talking about a retail shop. It could be who are the customers in my retail shop? Why would they be interested in this particular business? And then start to think about your circle of influence and the people that you know right off the bat that may know people that would be the kinds of people that you could go to and say, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to create. You have to be willing to do it a lot. And you shouldn't feel like, I don't have the perfect message, so I'm not going to say anything until I have the perfect message. Don't do that. Get your message as honed in as you possibly can and then decide, okay, torpedoes ahead, I'm going for it, and start to do it. But always keep yourself way open to revising your plan to constantly saying, this might have been a better way to do it. And you know how we were talking about a couple of minutes ago about don't take no for an answer? What I mean to say by that is if someone says to you, no, I'm not interested in it at all, don't decide to yourself, oh, this may not be a viable idea, forget it. 
If you can see it in your mind's eye, it is a viable idea. I guarantee it. But the big difference is people who give up will never, ever realize that. You cannot allow yourself to give up. You have to decide, I'm going to try it again. I'm going to say it differently. And to the person who says no to you, always thank them. With, with, thank them as much as you would thank them if they had said yes to you. And also take the opportunity when they say no to you to say, no problem. Can you please tell me what it is that, about this idea that did not work for you? See if you can get some information from them because that might give you a little more information in terms of how to hone in your presentation. Does that make sense? Oh, I agree completely. I agree completely. You know, and what it is is it's it's a, it's a basic, I feel a basic fundamental piece that many of us lose out on so many opportunities because either we didn't ask or we stopped asking. Yeah, without a doubt. And another thing, too, that you can do, and this is something that I work with people on doing, is before you do your ask, do yourself a favor and create a, just a one-page business plan. Because people who are seriously going to think about, yeah, let me see what you've got, you need to have something to give them. You need to show them this is what the idea is, this is what the creation is, and give them an idea because I tell you what, if someone comes up to you and says, I'm looking to create something, but they don't have anything in hand, how viable are you going to think that idea is, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have something in hand that you can actually present someone, this is the goal, this is the idea, this is what I see happening, it really becomes more of a, wow, this person is going to do something rather than someone thinking that maybe, oh, well, this is nice, it's all very pie in the sky to me. It, it, it changes the whole tenor of everything that you do when you can present a one-page business plan. Yeah. And it also, I think, puts people at ease to let them know that you've given thought to what you're putting together so they're not looking at you wondering if you really have even thought about what you're actually presenting to them. Um, that's my thought about that, too. That's absolutely correct, yeah. Wonderful. So I would put this in terms of steps. So step one is getting really clear about what it is that you need to say to people, being willing to ask, be willing to hear no, take the feedback. And what I think the goal that you said in that, Rita, is give as much thanks to the no and as much gratitude to the no as you do the yes and ask what you could do to actually hone in on what it was that they needed to hear or didn't hear so that you can then know how to refine your message to make it even better for the next person you present it to. That's exactly right. And let me tell you something about gratitude. I mean, I believe in gratitude as an attitude, period. But let me give you also this great little bit about gratitude that is so important. That person who said no to you, that you are now very gracious with, and you say, thank you so much for your time, thank you for listening to me, thank you for reading my business plan, that person may be saying no to you, but that person may know somebody else who will say yes. And that person would then say something to the effect of, oh, you know, I met with this fabulous gentleman today. His name is Rodney, and he had this great plan, and I was really thinking about, you know, should I do it or shouldn't, but I think this is really your sort of thing. And then kaboom, you've got it. So I always hold your head high. Always take a no as a yes when you say thank you about it, and still feel good about yourself and the person that you ask. It goes a long way, and people, you know, again, we're always wearing our brand, as we spoke about earlier, if you were on the call with Nikki. We're always the, we're the embodiment of our brand. Whenever, wherever we're out, people are watching us. We may not think people are paying attention to us, but they're paying attention and how we're carrying ourselves and what we're saying and how we're saying it. And you always want to be in that space when you're out, quote, unquote, in public. Um, you want to be really on as much as you can. I mean, you're going to have moments. Obviously, we're human. But you want to be on brand as much as possible all the time because when you – I've been in so many situations where I've overheard people talking about something that on the cursory had nothing to do with me, and I was able to step in if I was invited to step in and say, oh, I I know that. It yeah. happens all the time. You know, you never know where your, well, it was my mom always, you never know where your blessing is going to come from. So always be open <laughs> to, yeah. you know, to receive it. I think that's the most powerful thing. If you can take away nothing from these three days, take away that. You never know where it's going to come from. So always be ready to receive it. 
you know, and I always think that it's an important thing to to look at what your expectations are too, because I do think that there's an energy around that too. So we've just been talking a little bit about receiving no as a response and and how you would accept that no. I think it's important to to think about your expectations and go back to that place where your expectations should be that you're going to hear yes. That's an important thing to think about, but you should always be able to deal with no in the same elegant manner that you would deal with the yes. There's one other thing I want to talk, I want to go back to. We were talking about the steps we were laying out. I just want to reemphasize that the very number one step is to begin with the end in mind in terms of really fleshing out what that plan is for you. Everything starts with our intention and with that plan. So the more details that you can put to that, the better for you, and then start the process of everything else. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. Absolutely. I call it reverse engineer. You know, you start with the end in mind, then reverse engineer back to your, your daily, your you know, monthly steps. If it's a year, if it's several years goal, your yearly steps, monthly steps, weekly, you know, and those things then direct your daily actions that you take. And it becomes very simple, actually, because you start to ask yourself when you're trying to decide whether or not to invest in something or do something, does this fall in line with my fill in the blank? With my end game and this, end, or my end result in this place, and it's a clear yes or no. Yes. Yeah, it really is. And the thing is, too, one of the things that I loved in uh, reading about the this whole series of, of workshops that you've put together, Rodney, is that you talk about how there's never been a better time, and it's really true. There's never been a better time to decide I'm going to create this business or I'm going to create this position. I'm going to create something that is not the standard norm. There's never been a better time. It's The numbers are astronomical, but in the tens, if not hundreds of thousands, I would have to look up the exact stat, jobs are, we have new positions in new industries and new things today that didn't even exist nine years ago. So why not you? Why not you if you've had this idea in your mind and you've been saying to yourself, I really think I want to do this. Why not go for it? The only people that will make it happen are the ones that say, yes, I'm going to take that on as my own personal challenge to make this particular idea work. I am going to totally make this my profession. And it really is true. I mean, you can literally nowadays make money out of practically in, out of practically anything. I mean, people are paid. People pay other people to write tweets for them. Yes. If that's your thing that you really know how to do and you know how to do it in a way that other people haven't been able to figure out how to do, you can get, you can be paid for that. I mean, there's so many ways now. I mean, Barbara Winter in her amazing book, Making a Living Without a Job, I mean, she illustrates story after story after story of people who have turned businesses out of serving high tea. <laughs> you know, I mean, if there's someone out there who has, you know, any interest in your topic – at all, and Aaron uh, Huggins, who was on just before Rita, before, before you came on, Rita, spoke about the Google keyword search tool. I mean, that's like free research, global research. You can literally type in how to fill in whatever your subject is in real time, and get real world research about people are going online typing in how to do fill in the blank, and see how many people are searching for that term. You know, yeah. these are people who are looking for what you have. You know, I mean. Like you said, it's never – I mean, I, I did not write that copy lightly. It has never been a better time. Yeah. Oh, there's no question about it. I have worked with so many people that have reinvented themselves and have done things that are entirely different and just absolutely love what they're doing. I mean, the examples are crazy. I remember uh, one particular lady that I worked with not that long ago who decided that she did not want to be a lawyer any longer. I mean, oh, my goodness, she just said, enough. You know, I, I did this mainly because my dad was a lawyer, and it, I've never been happy in it. I want to do something entirely different. And we worked and worked and talked about different things. And she decided her whole thing was all about sense of style. And she decided, okay, what I want to do is I want to open up a business where I have stylists that work with me, and we go and take care of people who are like me, lawyers like me, that need to look sharp, that want to look sharp, that need to pull it all together for themselves. And I tell you what, she 
had this vision. I mean, it was a laser vision on what she wanted to do and how she wanted to do it, and bam. I mean, it's just been amazing. It's the, the change that can happen for you when you decide, this is what I want to do. I don't care if it seems ridiculous to someone else because she, in her case, by the way, she was really at first a little bit concerned about, well, what's my family going to say? What's this person going to say? Et cetera, et cetera. You know, your life is a work of art. You've got this one time to do it the way that you want to do it. That doesn't mean that you, you do anything negative to somebody else, but it certainly does mean that you do something positive for yourself and that you honor yourself and that you move forward with a dream because I absolutely know that nobody has a dream to do something with their life without having the ability to make it happen, whether they realize it or not. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Wow, this is good stuff, folks. I hope you're taking lots of notes here. You know, Rita, I want to move us along because we have about 20 minutes, but I want to make sure that we get these la- the other two points in because these are the bullet points I shared. Okay. We have in, and we talk about developing the gift, what it is we want to put out there in the world, and now we, let's have, we have this done. We are now ready to really refine the message and share it, share our voice with the world. And we may have, we probably hit on some of that already, but I just want to refine that a little bit further. You're out there asking for what it is that we want. We're out there looking for customers or you know people to to invest in us or what have you. How let me ask, let me take it a different direction for a moment. How can we take our our languaging that we're that we that we're gathering and how we're communicating with people and even use it in situations like social media, which is such an important tool in how we get our message out now. Because every word now we have character limits on how many words and how many letters we can use. Um, do you have any input about that, Rita? About how to use the various tools like social media to be able to oh, yeah. get our message out into the world? Yeah, most definitely. First off, it really does depend on what the business is because it's really, it's not like here's the pat way of doing it. Do it this way, follow this direction, and it'll work one size fits all. It does not. It really depends on what you're doing and how, and, and the audience that you're trying to reach. I will share this. One thing that is a given is that nobody likes to be sold to. So as an example, if I look on Facebook or I look on LinkedIn, and, and I live on LinkedIn quite a bit, if I look at Twitter, if I look anywhere and I see somebody trying to sell me something, uh, you know, I've got this brand new widget, buy my widget, this is a great widget, my widget is wonderful, et cetera, et cetera, I turn off, and most people do too. It's just, please, don't sell to me. Show me why I should pay attention to you. That's more important. So when you become basically, let's say you're selling a widget, Become an expert on why widgets are important. Share that kind of information on your social media channels. If you're going to do something like, let's say, as an example, I do this, and I'll just share one of my secrets. I'm on LinkedIn, like I said, and I live on LinkedIn quite a bit. And so a lot of the information that I share on LinkedIn has nothing to do with Rita Barber at all. It has to do with the stuff that Rita Barber knows about starting your own business, being a CEO, being a CFO. These are I work with a lot of CEOs and CFOs, and so it's good in order so that I continue to grow that business, it's good that people say, oh, look, she's got an article on here about why CEOs should not micromanage, as an example, or why this or why that. That is a way of basically having my, me aligned with the people that I work with and like to work with. It's a very important tool. I think about it in terms of when you go to the grocery store and you are thinking about buying a cereal, the most expensive cereal is where? Everybody think about this for one minute. Where is the most expensive cereal in the grocery store? Rodney, do you know? Always eye level. Always eye level. That's exactly right. They buy that space there. So you want to think whenever you're using your social network, where can I put the information at eye level that will let people know that I really know my stuff, whatever it is? So, and, and then let that let people know that this is why this person is an expert at this. All right? So then when you do go for the pitch, and if you do want to do it on your social network, you've already given value-added information to the people that look at it. So that then when you say, 
I've got this widget that I'm working with, people say, oh, yeah, that person knew about this and sent an article on that and shared information on this. I believe this person probably does know a lot about this particular widget, and then they want to come and talk to you more about it. But if you are busy selling to people, it's a turnoff. So my great suggestion to you is use it as a way to raise your platform in other ways of awareness to the people that you're trying to attract. Possibly the best type of marketing is educational-related marketing? I I would say so, absolutely, because that's value-added. Yep, that would be it. And that's what yeah, I always that's that's what I'm talking about when I say, you know, why CEO shouldn't micromanage their people or something like that. It's it you're offering that and that's what you want to do. It it lets people know that you you are or are becoming depending on what where you are, an authority in your particular area. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting. It's such an interesting paradox how the most one I think one of the most honorable professions when I say it because my mom's one um uh, <laughs> uh the most honorable professions and one of the lowest paid professions is that of a teacher mm. at least in the public school system, and how we really love to learn things. Erin, who was on a moment ago, said that the number one way that she has uh, created over three million views on her on her YouTube page is the result of teaching women how to Pilates and just giving them practical exercises that they can use and just sharing with them. She's not selling to them. She's just sharing with them, giving them exercises that they can do immediately and inviting them, again, going back to what we said a moment ago, asking them to subscribe to her channel so that she can give them she can give them more videos. Yes. Uh, that's a wonderful way of doing it too. Uh, you know, you can use YouTube in that matter. You, like I said, you you can't really do YouTube. I mean, Pilates too well on Twitter. I think <laughs> you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so YouTube really works great for Pilates. Uh, right. On the other hand, you can't really do a YouTube on going back to my thing. Why CEOs should not micromanage their people, but you can do a great LinkedIn article on that. So you Absolutely. want to think about where the right place is for you to be. And you also want to think about for people who may be, and this is the, the career, the big career side out of me that gets very pragmatic and practical with everybody about this. And in fact, Rodney, I used to work with high schoolers. And one mm-hmm. of the things that nowadays I just think about high schoolers nowadays, and I, I see different posts here and there on Facebook, and it just scares me. You really always want to think about what your image is, all right? Always make sure that your image is in concert with your highest place for yourself. And if there is that occasional time, like someone who I know, a friend of mine who I really like, I noticed that he had this picture there where he had this great big stein of beer and he had his face in the beer. And and I just said, you know, I'm thinking this is really not the best picture for you. Uh, it's not really going to work with what you do for a living. So ah, nobody will really pay attention to it. Everybody pays attention to it. I promise you. And the thing is, is that if you have something out there that is not good, no one will tell you what you have except for me. No one will tell you you shouldn't have that on there. That's dreadful. All right. But let me tell you something. You will not have people reach out to you if you've got that kind of stuff on there. So think about that very carefully. Absolutely, and I'll and I'll and I'll take it one step further. Is that I recently heard, and this was like a, as as much as a week ago, I believe that um, uh, some uh, some companies. I know you and I, Rita, live near the Silicon Valley area, but some companies are asking or requiring to get your login information for your Facebook and so and social media accounts so they can see. What yes. stuff you have on there as a part of their recruitment process? Yes, I, I I get I hear about that all the time. Yeah, it totally does that. And also, nothing is private on there. I mean, one of my uh, I shouldn't say favorite. That's a cruel thing to say. But one of my most interesting stories has to do with a Fat Paycheck. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but here's the story with Fat Paycheck. This woman was offered a job, I believe, by Cisco. And she said, I wonder if I should take this really boring, stupid job, but it has a fat paycheck, or if I should pass. And she brought up the name Cisco in there. 
And she got a response back on her Twitter account. We of Cisco are familiar with the ways of Twitter. Do not worry about coming in for the paycheck. Do not worry about coming in. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, really and truly, it, it you want to think about that. Yeah. Think about what you're saying and where you're saying it and how you're saying it and all that. Always keep it positive. Always keep it upbeat. And always keep it something that is not going to be harmful to you or anyone else. Mm-hmm. You know, I sum it up very simply. I don't put anything out there you don't want your mother to see. I say the same thing. <laughs> yes, I do. Mm-hmm. So that sums it up. I can tell count countless stories of people in my industry that have lost jobs that weren't even really, I mean, that they were just, you know, just, I mean, either they had just gotten like this particular story of this woman that you shared or things that they were in line for that they knew they were in line for and the offers were just pulled. Yes. Yes, absolutely. It's something that you have to be very careful. In fact, my own son, who is now working at Oracle, uh, you know, thank heaven, he really listens to what I say about that sort of stuff. And he was told by the person who hired him that one of the first things that they did was they checked his Facebook account. And thankfully, he he doesn't put anything that's wild and crazy, and I'm sure he does wild and crazy things. He didn't put any of that stuff on his Facebook. What they basically saw was, a, a fun guy who apparently likes Star Wars and some other stuff like that, and it was just all very, very good. So you, you always err on the side of not having something that can be damaging to you on there rather than saying, oh, I'm sure this isn't all that bad. If you have to wonder if it isn't all that bad, it is all that bad. <laughs> Great point. Great point. Now, Rita, this is moving on to our third point. And um, and I just this one here is so important, and I know that you have a lot to share about this. Is overcoming the naysayers, allowing our voice to rise above. Yes, I I you know thank you for bringing that up because that's something that I think is so important to think about. I don't know what it is, but within our own circle of friends and family, we have people who can be wet blankets on whatever it is that we're trying to achieve. And it's very difficult. And in a way, it's like it's one of those things where you have a pillow and you rip it open and all these feathers are flying all over the place. And that's your idea that's out there. And and you're trying to just hone it all in. People can be a wet blanket to some of the things that you want to do. And so I always caution people, as you're first working on your idea, as you're first working on a new business or a new career or what have you, don't share it with absolutely everybody because it's very difficult once that negative stuff, that negative reaction comes out there, it's very difficult to pick yourself up and dust yourself off. It, it can happen only so many times. I'll share a story with you. I decided at a certain point that I wanted to do something different in terms of helping another group of people. And I decided I want to work with people that are in recovery from drug and alcohol abuse. And so I went to some of the big recovery camps that they have, and I said, this is the stuff that I want to talk about. It's sort of the same sort of thing that we're talking about, which is a recreation of yourself, rewriting your life, rewriting your career. And so uh, I was hired for at a couple of different facilities to go work with people on a weekly basis, kind of like a mini workshop, so to speak. I was very, very excited about that. I had my whole syllabus worked out. I knew everything I was going to talk about. I was just thrilled. I then went to go visit my father and my stepmother. They took me out to a restaurant. My stepmother went to the restroom. When she came back, and while she was gone, I was telling my dad all about how I'd been hired by these facilities. When my stepmother came back, she only caught kind of the middle of the conversation, and she said, oh, Rita, nobody will ever hire you at those facilities. There's no way you'll get a job there. And I said to her, well, it's a good thing I didn't speak to you before I got the jobs because I got hired. And she said, oh, really? And I said, yeah. And you know what? The thing is, I've often reflected on that because I wondered if she had said something like that to me before I had applied, would I have applied? And if I had applied, would I have felt the 100% sense of, yes, I can do this, yes, I can make an impact? Or would I have had this little nagging thing in the back of my head, my stepmother saying, they'll never hire you? So you have to be very, very selective about the people that you share your ideas with. 
is so selective to the point that with some of the clients that I work with, when we create a visualization and basically a time chart for everything that they want to do, I will sometimes suggest, depending on what their situation is, put it on the inside of your closet door. So it's something that you can look at every single time. It's right there, but it's not something that's exposed to everybody that's there. Because people, even people that love you, people will be a naysayer. They'll they'll drop a, a wet blanket on the whole thing. I had one woman once spend about an hour telling me why I shouldn't do something that I wanted to do. It was exhausting. And the thing is, is that it took a lot for me to just totally change that whole paradigm because after a while, negative stuff, it seeps into your pores and you don't want it there. So stay away from it. So here's the flip side. What if you've already told somebody your idea and somebody has already been a wet blanket? What do you do about that? This is where it's so important, again, to put pen to paper and to have stuff written down for yourself. Because, number one, you need to go back to your original notes, your original message to yourself about what you want to do, why you want to do it, and what that end result is for you. That's extremely important. And number two, you need to dig deep into yourself because I guarantee you every single person that's on this phone call right now has somehow or another had some sort of an adversity that you have risen above. And you need to remind yourself of that. And you need to remind yourself of that because it's an opportunity for you to say, it doesn't really matter what so-and-so says. I know I can do it anyway. Whenever anyone tells me that I can't do something, the first thing that I say to myself, and when I was 18, I was told I would not be able to buy a house. And I did. There's always something that we've done in our life that most people say we couldn't do that we did do. Let that be the foundation that lets you know that your idea is truly worthy and that you should definitely go for it. Bravo. Well said. Well said. If you take nothing from this conversation, take that. I think the first def- def- I think the first default is when someone tells you no, that's when, oh, okay, and literally have that, have that, okay. And you don't have to get, see, that's the thing we get. Sometimes we want either we'll take it in, internalize it, and, and accept it as truth, or we'll get into defending. Yes. Which I believe sucks up a lot of precious energy that we don't need to be wasting time on. It's not about whether or not they go along with the program. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, there's situations where you have family members and so forth that you do have to negotiate and navigate some things around. But it's not about you needing to get them to to come over to your side. I find if I just go for what it is I want in my life, just almost by osmosis, people will start to shift and go and do their own thing too. Yes, I agree with that, definitely. You know, the thing is is that I absolutely know that there are no accidents, and I absolutely know that when we have an idea in our mind of something that we want to do, it is there with a purpose. You can think about it almost as if seeds were broadcast into the air, and one sticks in your mind. That seed is planted in your mind, and you need to give it the opportunity to grow and to bloom and to be everything that it needs to be. You need to do that for yourself because that's part of why you're here, And you need to do it for the people that you love. And this is a very important part, too. When you're thinking about what you're doing, don't think of it in terms of just being for you. Always infuse everything that you want to do with the images of the people that you love the most. And always do that for two specific reasons. Number one, even those people that that you love that might be naysayers right now, They really do want to see you happy. They just don't really realize that you've got the key, you've got the path. They may think that they know better for you. And number two, and even more importantly, you cannot have greatness for yourself or for others if you don't have greatness for yourself. And I think about that all the time, and I live my life that way. I have a son and a daughter. I love those two people like nobody's business. And the way that I conduct my life and the things that I aspire for time and time again in my life is to set an example for them so that they can go for that or something even better in their own life. Brilliant. Rita, you know, I, I couldn't have picked if I tried. And, you know, we every everything worked out for this event the way it was supposed to happen. And I couldn't have thought of a better person. If I had tried to manipulate this, it wouldn't have happened <laughs> <laughs> to have as the best person to, to close out our, our amazing three-day event. And I, it's just such a gift to have you here and have your words. And I hope as you all move forward 
uh, with your lives as we're all getting ready to part, you know, ways in our own way. I mean, we'll still, you'll still be hearing from me, believe me, but, <laughs> but um, you know, that you take everything that you've heard over the last three days, whether you were on a few of the calls or one or two of them or all of them, but if you definitely are on this one, you know, please take this information, this, these resources that you've learned and move forward in your life and go for what you want. I mean, this is, like I said, it's never been a better time. That you is have correct. to do it. You have to do it. So with that said, Rita, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, too. And thank you, everybody. Thank you for being a part of this. We have entered the age of creative self-employment. In the new economy, people are creating true security for themselves. That's why I believe there's never been a better time in history to monetize your gifts. So if you're ready to take control of your financial and creative future, I have something for you. It's my free audio and PDF program, 57 Ways to Monetize Your Gifts and Create True Security for Yourself. And you can get that at my website, getpaidforyourcreativity.com forward slash 57 Ways Gift.